Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Something Rhymes With Purple, the podcast for word nerds, but also anybody who has ever stopped to think, I love that word, or I really hate that word. I'm Susie Dent. I work on a program called Countdown, and I also dabble in dictionaries uh, pretty much all the time. And with me is my wonderful co-presenter and friend, Giles Brandreth. Hi, Giles. It's good to be with you. We haven't met in a long while, no. and uh, I would like you to be the first person that I hug, but you wouldn't want to hug me right now because I've got a cold, uh, a stinking yes. cold. And, you have uh, got a cold, and I don't know how you've managed this because I'm looking at you on a Zoom screen, but uh, we were chatting a little bit before we came on air, and I now have a sore throat. It's the power of personality. <laughs> My wife has been saying for me for years, you know, a marvellous personality, Jazz, but do just tone it down a bit, if you wouldn't mind. Just spare people. You don't need to give them the full thing every time. But I'm so keen on you, Susie, that I've clearly been breathing into the microphone. It's been going down the line, and I'm so sorry. It's the kind of illness yeah. equivalent of um, echopraxis, and echopraxis is the sort of process by which if someone yawns, then it's immediately infectious and you, you have to yawn as well. Um, oh. so I, I don't quite know how that works for sore throats, but yes, literally just come on. I think it's all psychosomatic. What do we want to talk about this week? Well, every now and again, we like to shine the spotlight on one person who has contributed greatly to um, to our language. Um, so we've we focused on George Orwell, haven't we? Uh, Dr. Johnson, of course, Charles Dickens. And Giles, you teased a couple of weeks ago uh, someone who I'm going to be completely honest about. I have not read very much of at all, uh, which is appalling, really, because he has made an impact in a very sort of strange, slightly tangential way, he has made an impact on our language. Um, you will find m many of his words in the dictionary, but I wouldn't say many of them equally are words that we would use every day. But you know so much more about him than I do that I'm going to sit back and listen today. We're going to talk about James Joyce. One of my favourite words that he came up with is smile smirk, S-M-I-L-E-S-M-I-R-K, -E which is a, a cross between a genuine smile and a disdainful smirk, a smile smirk. He did have an amazing way with words, James Joyce. We are so blessed, we who speak and read the English language, that uh, Ireland exists because Ireland has given us some of the greatest, wittiest, most profound and exciting writers. If you like the theatre, as I do, you love the plays of Sheridan and Oscar Wilde and Bernard Shaw, three great Irish playwrights. James Joyce also wrote a play, Exiles, but he's most famous for his novels. And I do know a little bit about him, only because I did him for um, O-Level and A-Level. Ah. Uh, and I've dug up my notes, and I thought I might begin, since you know so little about him, by just reminding you and everybody else who James Joyce was. James mm. Augustine Aloysius Joyce, great name, born the 2nd of February, 1882, uh, same date, 2nd of February, is one of my daughters. She's called Scythrid, mm. thought we'd give her an interesting name. And he died on the 13th of January, 1941. Novelist, poet, born in Dublin, where his father, and this is relevant to his stories, uh, was somebody who went round collecting the rates. He was educated at a Jesuit college and uh, he became captain of school. He then went on to University College Dublin. Uh, he had a great imagination uh, and a great mind. He studied naturalist and symbolist, symbolist literature in Paris. He married a lady called Nora Barnacle in 1904 when he was just One 22. One of the best names ever, surely. Isn't it a great name? And she, again, is important to his writing. Well, uh, Nora is a fascinating name. Uh, Barnacle is uh, an even better name in some ways. Uh, and he left Ireland and then lived on the continent, teaching languages at uh, Trieste and in Switzerland uh, for more than 10 years. And living abroad is, is relevant, again, to his writing. One of his uh, devotees who helped him with his writing, and also is a great Irish writer, Samuel Beckett, who also contributed to, to the language, though he wrote mainly in French and then translated his plays uh, back into English. Anyway, back to Joyce. His first publication was a volume of lyrics, uh, sort of poems and songs, called Chamber Music. And um, really, he becomes famous, and we begin to recognise him through his short stories, Dubliners. 
and that was published in 1914. And, and that's, in a way, a very good book with which to start, Stories About Dublin. And the book I did at school, and this is how most people listening to this would have been introduced to him, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's a biographical novel, and that came out in 1916. But his fame rests on the book that I have read, Mm -hmm. And many have tried to read and abandon it. I don't pretend that I've understood it all or possibly even understood any of it, really. It's a novel called Ulysses. It was published in Paris because of the censorship elsewhere. It was reset six times by the printers because Joyce kept rewriting it every time he got the proofs. But eventually... Sounds like my books. <laughs> yes, but if you were James Joyce, the misprints in your book would have been treated as sort of a great original new words. Um, anyway, when eventually it was published, he got the first printed copy on his 40th birthday. And one critic at the time described it as the greatest novel of the 20th century, while another said it was the foulest book ever printed. Yes, so we have uh, to at some point talk about how scatological he is because it made a huge impact for that reason as well, didn't, didn't it? I, I think Ulysses is a little bit like Tristram Shandy. It's the book that you take on your summer holidays because you are finally going to read it and you never quite get round to it. Yeah, absolutely. I still haven't finished War and Peace. Uh, never mind À la recherche du temps perdu. Oh, Proust, yes. Uh, Proust, well, there's the so many film. volumes of that. Uh, well, yeah. exactly. The films, they, they help us through. Uh, and uh, people have tried to make things like Ulysses in, into films. But you're right. The language was banned in America till 1933 when a judge ruled that while in many places it is somewhat emetic, nowhere does it tend to be aphrodisiac. Uh -huh. uh, and the story deals with a single day in Dublin. Uh, and it is amazing. Let's begin to explore some of the words that he uses and have some fun with those. But I will just share with you my favourite Samuel Beckett story, because it gives you a good impression of, of what Joyce was doing with language. Beckett, the man who wrote Waiting for Godot, was a, was a younger person and uh, helped Joyce in his writing. He would dictate to Beckett and Beckett would write it down. And once or twice he was dictating a bit of Finnegan's Wake, another of his great works. And in the middle of one of the sessions, there was a knock at the door, which Beckett didn't hear. And so Joyce said, come in. And Beckett wrote that down. And afterwards, uh, Joyce was rereading what Beckett had written down and said, well, what's this come in? And Beckett said, well, you said that. And Joyce thought for a moment and then decided, let it stand. <laughs> so he was quite willing to see coincidence as a collaborator. So I don't think we need to worry too much. Somebody knocks at the door, he says, come in. Uh, Beckett writes it down as part of the book and it stays in the book. So um, <laughs> we, can be quite re we can be quite relaxed, I think, in our, in our ways. So let's choose, let's, let, let's look at some of the words. I mean, he's most famous, I think, for, for uh, a hundred letter monster of a word that appears in Finnegan's Wake that begins ba 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 dai ga ga ta well I can't even do it people will have to look it up or even read Finnegan's Wake do you know about this word yeah well it's it's supposed to be a representation of the thunderclap that accompanied the fall of Adam and Eve so it it's supposed to i guess sound incredibly ominous and um, and heavy and powerful. It's got Bronto in it, which of course is Greek for thunder. It's got a thunt in the middle um, and it's got a thunuk at the end, which sounds very Norse-like. Um, and if you imagine a thunder as Viking. So it's a very clever word. Can I pronounce it? No, no chance. If you, I mean, it's one of those words you'd have to sort of break down into 10 parts and then you probably could. Because I think in the middle there, I, I can see after Bronto, there is tonnerre, which yes. is the French for thunder, isn't it? It absolutely is, tonnerre. And there's the Italian tuono is in there. Okay. And the Japanese caminari. Very I mean, clever. it's the most famous of the 10 equally enormous words Joyce conjured up. It's a fantastic word. As I say, th these are ones that stick in the memory, if not on our tongues, because I don't think we particularly, you know, use many of the words that he came up with, but you can admire their flair and their versatility. versatility. There is one word that he does use, which I actually 
quite like and I think we could do with bringing back into the um, into the language. And that's uxorious. Do you know what that means? I think it means, it's something to do with your wife, isn't it? It means, is it, yes. does it mean being devoted to your wife? Yes. So um, I guess Joyce absolutely sort of lived this out. This was a husband who dotes on his wife, possibly slightly obsessively. And there is a single word that describes the reverse, a woman excessively fond of her husband, that is meritorious. But for some reason that wasn't picked up, really. Um, but he himself said, am I right, Jazz, which I think is beautiful, what truly matters is that love loves to love love. That's lovely. No, he that. did. I mean, what is interesting about his books is that the early ones are certainly the easy ones to read, uh, but even the ones that you don't quite understand, it's rather like uh, I don't understand music, but my friend Sheila Hancock, we've been making a television series where we go out on canals together, she has got me some ear pods and is making me listen to classical music and is trying to explain what it's all about to me. And I'm not really understanding what it's all about, but I'm quite enjoying it. And that's a little bit what the... There's music in the language of James Joyce. You don't always have to understand it. Uh, taratat is one of his words. Taratat. Well, it's clear. It, it's it's a version of rat tat, tat isn't it? Mm. Someone, the sound of someone knocking at a door. Yes. And um, it goes into the Guinness Book of Records, I think, as the longest single word palindrome ever used oh, in English really? literature. T a t t a double r a t t. A T. Yes. I mean, he's a strange character and he has a tough life because after he's written Ulysses for the next 17 years, he begins to go blind. And this is when he's working on Finnegan's Way. This is why he had to dictate uh, to Samuel Beckett. And the truth is, the early stories are comprehensible. The later stuff is kind of musical and strange, and some of it really is, to me anyway, unintelligible. And he's experimenting with language. He ends up quite sadly because during the Second World War he is in Zurich and he dies there. I mean, people say worn out by privations and worry. So his personal story has great joy in it and great unhappiness too. And the language is, I think, more intriguing and interesting than changing our language. I mean, he does take a word like sausage, though, and use it in a way that hadn't been used before. Do you know about that? Yes, he verbs it, doesn't he? So, you know, as we've often said on the podcast, a lot of people blame verbing on North American English and just say, you know, this is a terrible sign of degradation of English is that we turn everything into verbs and, and verbs into nouns as well. But actually, this has been going on for a very long time. And yes, sausage transformed the noun, sorry, <laughs> Joyce transformed sausage into, into um, a verb from the noun, meaning, this is according to the OED, to subject a personal thing to treatment reminiscent of the manufacture or shape of a sausage, which I think is oh, brilliant. It is good, isn't it? It'll be used now, figuratively, obviously. One of the words I think he has introduced to the language or, or given it a new twist is botch up. Mm, yeah. Similar to bog up, I think, but botch up. Tell us about that. Yes, so um, botch up it's been used for a long time. So Joyce definitely didn't um, coin this. So it's been used since the 16th century, meaning to repair hastily, a bit like bodge, um, which is another English dialect word, to make a mess of something. But again, Joyce took that uh, verb and reworked it into a noun. So a botch up in Ulysses is a, a, a total mess, a botch up of a concert. Yeah, yeah. A, a veritable botch up. Yeah. 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 What about chiseler? Again, he, it's a bit like Shakespeare, isn't it? It's very difficult to know whether a particular writer actually coined a phrase or whether he actually popularized something that was already in common currency um, or at least bubbling under. So it's possible that chiseler had already been in use in Irish slang before he put it into print in the 1920s, but it comes from a slang use of chisel to mean to fleece money from someone. So a chiseler, he uses it as a nickname for a young child in Ulysses. Now, you can tell me this. Do you know whether chiseler is actually a fleecer or a swindler or works for a criminal of some kind? No, I don't think he no. is. I think it's just an expression, a little nickname he gives him, like a, like a cheeky brat. Yeah, well, then that would be a little bit like uh, a wag, because a wag, which we now apply to a comedian, actually began as a 
uh, a nickname really for a mischievous child and it was a wag halter so fairly dark humor here the idea is that the child is so mischievous that they might wag i.e hang from a halter the, the noose of a gallows so um yeah it's, it's a similar idea i think one of his words that i think is quite useful is mono ideal mm, tell me about that one well, mono-ideal basically means expressing or conveying only one idea, okay. mono-ideal. Yeah. And we now live in a world where there are people who are sort of obsessed with one thing and bang on about it to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. Uh, and I find that slightly irritating. And I, I think that's a, a coinage of Joyce's. Mm -hmm. Mono-idealism uh, existed apparently before him mm -hmm. uh, in the mid 1800s, meaning a, a kind of single mental fixation. But uh, mono ideal is a word that he came up with. I mean, what he was really into, I think, is what we call onomatopoeia. Remind me yeah. what onomatopoeia means and and what how it's yes, formed. Yes, onomatopoeia is kind of it's like sort of sounds symbolism almost, isn't it? It is. Um, it's used of a word that represents through its sound the thing that it describes. So it's the formation of a word from a sound that's associated with it, like cuckoo or um, sizzle, uh, that kind of thing. One of my absolute favourites, I was aware of this one because I think it's it's possibly one of his most characteristic sentences, popismic, popismic. So that's the smacking sound of a person's lip, popismic. Popismic. It's quite hard to say, but the, the sentence that he uses it in in Ulysses is absolutely brilliant. I'll see if I can get through this. Flory whispers to her, whispering love words, murmur lip lapping loudly. Popismic plop slop. It's That's wonderful. Perfect. It is it's a stream kind of consciousness, of... isn't it? Really. And it's verbal music. Extraordinary. Yeah. Another of his onomatopoeic words is. <laughs> I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Who who is he, he isn't here to tell us. M R K G N A O. M R K G N A O. Mm -hmm. It's uh, his version of meow. It's used several times and with a variety of spellings in Ulysses. It's um, meow. The cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk white teeth. Meow. Oof. And you see, it works in its own way. He is an extraordinary person. Um, do you know the word polluted? Polluted. Yes, I do know that one because it is. Should we come to this one after the break? Because it is one of many, 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 many synonyms in the English language for being drunk. So, just tell me about polluted. Polluted. Well, if you're polluted, then you're very, very drunk. And Joyce used this in Dubliners, which mm. is his uh, early work, stories that I do recommend. And it was probably inspired, I think, by the early word bluted. Yes. Polluted. It's a kind of Irish version of bluted, bluted. Uh, it, it means being drunk, doesn't it? Are there, are there lots of words like this? Oh, my goodness. So um, the brilliant slang lexicographer Jonathan Green always says, the waterfront of slang is narrow but very, very deep. And he produces these most fantastic timelines of particular themes within English. And you can trace the different synonyms for that particular concept. Some of them are quite rude. You will find the vagina, penis, all sorts of things in there. But when it comes to drunkenness, oh, the timeline is absolutely incredible. And quite a lot of them are uh, in the OED, but I have to say slang furnishes a whole lot more. So if, if you can, I would urge you to look up Jonathan Green, spelled Jonathan Green, his timelines of slang. They're all free, um, all available online, as is his fantastic slang dictionary. And uh, yeah, I mean, polluted, bluted, just two of many. Did James Joyce invent the quark? Q-U-A-R-K. So what did he use it for in, in the phys physical sense, as we would use it today? In, jo in, in Finnegan's Wake, he has three quarks for Muster's Mark. Uh, and it sounds to me just like a, a bit of rhyming fun that he's having. Um, yeah, three quarks for Muster Mark. Sure, he hasn't got much of a bark. And sure, he, any he has, it's all beside the mark. Uh, this is from Ulysses. Well, apparently, a US physicist called Murray Gell Mann... He coined it in 1964, but he did later associate it with that use of quark by James 
Joyce. Um, so definitely influential there. Um, he said, I employed the sound quark for several weeks. This is the physicist speaking in 1963 before noticing quark in Finnegan's Wake, which I had perused from time to time. The allusion to three quarks seemed perfect. I needed an excuse for retaining the pronunciation quark, despite the occurrence of Mark, Bark, Mark and so forth in Finnegan's Wake. I found that excuse by supposing that one ingredient of the line three quarks for Master Mark was a cry of three quarts for Mister, heard in H.C. Earwicker's pub. Gosh, that's there's a whole lot going on in that quote. Um, so actually it's quark rather than quark, I think. I'm going to check. So if you can hear this, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, you can um, click on uh, audio and get the pronunciation. So here you go. Quark. There you go. And in the US, quark. There we go. I use the word ring roundabout because I rather liked it before the break mm. and that's used in Ulysses to mean uh, to completely surround something okay scribbledy hobble scribbledy hobble oh, I like that sounds like hobbledy hoy what's that a scribbledy was, hobble that was the name Joyce gave to one of his notebooks in which he jotted down names and words ideas turns of phrase anecdotes and uh, the word has made its way into some English dictionaries uh, as the sort of name for a rough notebook you know I'm going to jot that down in my scribbledy hobble I wonder whether he actually lingered over these confections and really thought very hard about how he put them in or whether they were just very spontaneous, as I say, streams of consciousness, which which is what we get in Ulysses. Um, it's in the Oxford English Dictionary. It appears as the first entry in one of his notebooks for Finnegan's Wake. And he uses it, substitutes scribble the hobble for an earlier instance of scribble the hoy, used with reference to school children working at their lessons. And in fact, remember I said it reminded me of hobbledehoy. That already existed since the 18th century. And I love hobbledehoy because it describes a teenager, particularly a boy, who is kind of in that sort of slightly difficult twilight stage between boyhood and manhood. And so is ever so slightly awkward, a hobbledehoy. Very good. I mean, with some of these words, I, I think because of the story I told you about Beckett, writing it all down and and when the when he said come in keeping it in the book i think a lot of it just sort of came to him like he he has the word umbershoot in oh, his oh uh, i love that because it's it's a riff on bumbershoot isn't it which is yeah. my favorite term for an umbrella and what's the origin of bumbershoot is that a victorian term for an umbrella when, when it is the... victorian yeah so the bumber is simply from umbrella bumber and the shoot bit, I think, is, although it's written S-H-O-O-T, that is a variant of shoot as in a parachute because it kind of looks like a parachute that you sort of have above your head. So bumble shoot. It's particularly North American, that one. I love it. And umbrella, does that come from the word orb, meaning yes. shade? Yes, they were sunshades originally, umbrellas. But, of course, particularly in Britain and many parts across the world, um, uh, I was actually hearing a lot about the thunder plumps in Florida uh, this week. Um, thunder plumps, just to remind you, being those heavy, sudden, unexpected downpours of, of rain. But in, in rain-soaked countries, the umbrella actually became a, a rain protection rather than the sun protection for which it was originally designed. I think what Joyce was doing is when he needed a word, if there wasn't a word that came to mind, he invented one. Wentzness is a good example of that. I like that. Wentzness. I mean, it means what it says. Someone or something's wentness is, is sort of the source point, where, where they came from, the place yeah. from which it, it came, Wentzness. Wentzness is gorgeous. And actually, we have a letter from uh, someone who's also been pondering some new word creations in the spirit of Joyce. Um, so this was a letter from Minnesota and Paul Peterson, who says, we recently gave him the word biblioclept, meaning someone who steals books. And he's wondering if there's a word for the opposite. Uh, his wife, for example, firmly believes that no one should own books and that if you read a book you love, you ought to give it to someone who you think would love it as well, with no expectation of ever seeing it again. Is there a word for such a person? And uh, he suggests, Paul, a bibliodore or a pan-biblist which are, are great, I think. And, um, yeah, I've been pondering this a little and I can't actually come up with anything better. So it would be great to put this out to the purple people and, and ask them if they can coin a word that means somebody who loves to give books away. Um, in the language of Easter Island, there is famously documented by Adam Jaco de Buono in his book Toujours Tingo, 
the word tingo, uh, which means to borrow objects from a friend's house one by one until there's nothing left. I think he in turn may have got that from his his predecessor, Howard Rheingold, but it's brilliant, Tingo's. But I can't think of anything for somebody who just loves to give books away. Do you? Well, do you, do you I, I can't, books? and I think we need to challenge the purple people to bring yeah. out their inner James Joyce and come up with an original word. And if you are, if you have read any James Joyce, particularly if you've read the, the tough ones, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, and want to put us right on any of this, or tell us what your favourite James Joyce word is, do communicate with us. I think my probably my favourite one is Yogi Boogie Box. Um, Yogi Boogie Box. It's just, it's fun. It, he coined that word in Ulysses, and it's it to describe the the equipment and paraphernalia that a spiritualist carries around with them. It's his Yogi Boogie Box. So if you can come up with a a, a word for uh, the Bibliodore, uh, or uh, your favourite word by James Joyce, or a new word in the James Joyce tradition, do please communicate with us. And if you haven't read any James Joyce, Give him a go and probably start where I started when I was a teenager with the easy stuff, the uh, portrait of an artist as a young man or the Dubliners. And approach his letters with caution, although they are interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we've had another letter. Yes, about vice. Yes, this is Ryan from Dorset. He says, I've just had a random, random word thought. And of course, you were the first people I thought of. Who, what are the roots of the word vice? I'm thinking of the vice in vice president to do with holding a position of authority versus the vice associated with immoral behaviour. And he says the same thing, some would say. Um, so uh, thank you, Ryan, for that. Uh, well, the vice, as in vice captain, it simply means a substitute for, and that comes from the Latin vic, V-I-C, which means change. And that also gave us vicarious, uh, which means that you are experiencing something through the medium of someone else. So it's all the idea of channeling authority through someone else or substituting, being substitute for someone else. So that's the vices in vice captain, vice president, etc. The vice that is the sense of immorality has a different root. That's from the Latin vicium, V-I-T-I-U-M, meaning vice as well, which gave us vicious. And that originally meant kind of showing immorality, if you like, but it was extended to mean savage in descriptions of bad-tempered horses and later came to mean spiteful. And now it's actually even stronger. It kind of goes against the tide of many English words where they lose their power. This one has actually gained in power over time. And finally, there's also the tool sense as well, the vice that's a kind of, you know, a screw or a winch. That, again, is different, showing just how many journeys all our vocabulary makes. That comes from the Latin vitis, V-I-T-I-S, which means a vine. And that's because of the spiral look of the tool and the spiral growth of a grapevine's tendrils. Well, my favourite letter of the week comes from one of our regular correspondents, Professor Marc Laviolette, who is in the Department of... He has a great name and he has a great job in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario. And it's appropriate for this part of the podcast because he writes, Surely the collective noun for three vocabulary words suggested weekly by English lexicographer Susie Dent and aimed at improving our elocutions and writings is a trident. Ah, oh, brilliant. Isn't that Why clever? Why we think of a, that? Yes, yeah, very a good. trident. What is the origin of the word trident, in fact? Uh, it means three, three toothed, really. So you have to remember that ah. um, dent, dent means tooth, and possibly my ancestors had quite prominent teeth. Or alternatively, it might be topographical and refer to dent in uh, in Yorkshire. But yeah, it means three toothed. So it was the three pronged fish spear, wasn't it? That um, Poseidon or Neptune had, and obviously yeah. That's, born by Britannia. So yeah, three tooth is a trident. Three tooth. But I, I love well, there idea. you are, a trio. And so have you got something we can get our teeth into? Have you got a trio of interesting words to share with us this week, Susie? Yes. I have a dialect word today from uh, Devon in Britain, which describes you if you are in a state of nervous apprehension. I seem to spend my my life in that we were talking about being on tender hooks in a state of nervous apprehension you can say you're a twitterty snip twitterty snip i like that twitterty snip that's a little that's a sl slightly joycean word in itself it is, isn't, isn't it, it? twitterty snip 
Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Now, I don't know if you remember, but one of my trios for a, a little while back was a spindrift, which is one of my absolute favourite English words. And spindrift is the tang of the sea that's carried by the air. You know, sometimes you can taste on your lips the salty tang mm. of the sea. But if the sea is particularly whipped up by the wind and producing a lot of spindrift, it is spumescent. Spumescent means frothy or foam-like. Spumescent. Well, I think that is worthy of James Joyce too. Spumescent. And finally, a gallimorphy. I think some people will be will be familiar with this one. A gallimorphy is simply a hodgepodge or a jumble or a bit of a mess. And it comes from the French for an unappetizing dish made of all sorts of different ingredients, a strange concoction. A gallimorphy. Like a hodgepodge. Exactly. Um, or a actually, hot shop. Uh, what, is, what is the yes, or indeed the Joyce word podshop? But what is a hodge? Where does a hodgepodge come from? And is it a hodgepodge or is it a hodgepodge? Oh, do you know? Look, we we need to return to food, and I'll talk about it then because there are so many different words that uh, for a complete mess that are related to food. So leave hodgepodge with me. Good. We'll come back to food. We'll come back to you very shortly. I'll give you one more James Joyce story and then a poem, a short poem, by somebody who was a, a friend of his and also rather a strange person who ended up pretty unhappily. Um, but this is my favourite Joyce story. A young man comes up to him in Zurich and says to James Joyce, may I kiss the hand that wrote Ulysses? To which Joyce replied, no, it did a lot of other things too. And now the poem. And I thought I'd do a poem today by uh, Ezra Pound, controversial poet, strange man, 1885, 1972. And uh, he was a friend uh, and collaborator of James Joyce at times. And the poem, is simply four lines. And the days are not full enough, and the nights are not full enough, and life slips by like a field mouse, not shaking the grass. Oh, I always choose such beautiful poems. Excellent. Well, thank you. Sorry, I was just pondering that one. Thank you uh, for listening. As always, please do recommend us to friends if you liked us, or better still, get in touch at purple at something else dot com. Something else rhymes with purple. <laughs> something rhymes with purple as well as something else rhymes with purple is a something else production. It was produced by Lawrence Bassett with additional production from Harriet Wells, Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Jay Beale, and Popismic Plopslop himself. Hi, it's Gully.